Good morning, New Day Fellowship. I'm going to open this in prayer. <clears throat> Bless this day, O Lord, and O my soul and all that is within me. Uh, give you, me the words that you would have me give this day. Uh, thank you for the change in temperature. This coolness is very appreciated. Thank you for our guests and for those who are listening. And uh, be a blessing, blessing to those here who hear your words. All these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So um, today we're going to talk about weather. And I'm going to start, though, with, with some of the, uh, the weather at kind of like sort of the end, not the end, but and then work backwards. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly, this was God's son. That's Matthew 27, 54. Truly, this was the son of God. Uh, the the uh, Latin is divi filium. Um, we've got to remember that the Romans had a little con different concept of God because they had you know polytheism, multiple gods, and so you know it's kind of like even emperors call themselves gods. You know I'm a god and you know whatever. They had all the Roman gods and goddesses. So what does that really mean? I don't know, but I think that it's one thing that you'd have to kind of look at and say something big in the weather happened and the centurion felt it was directly related to what was happening where he was and so he made this statement the the uh, mark the, in the synoptic gospels mark 15:39 says now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last he said truly this man was god's son well i'm also going to take you back to amos 8 9 10 and on that day declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. That was, you know, several hundred years before Jesus walked the earth. And so in Luke 23, 24, his account of the, cru of the crucifixion was... It was now about noon, and darkness came over the land until three in the afternoon. What actually they, I think they kind of put in there was it was the sixth hour, and so if you've got dawn at about six, it's about noon, and it lasted till the ninth hour, which is about three. So that the, but the, the verse here has already put that in there. It's talking about noon and until three in the afternoon. Well, the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, "Father, into you, your hands I commend my spirit." Having this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. So at least he's testifying to some kind of cosmic event that made him believe that, that something wasn't right about this or something else happened. Um, by the way, if you want to mark your calendars, and we're supposed to be able to see it really well, the next uh, solar eclipse is October 14, 2023. It's supposed to occur at about noon. Uh, so about the same time that this happened different days but it's kind of I think it's supposed to start in like the northwest and then it's supposed to work its way down and come across but apparently this area is in a good location to see a good total eclipse my recommendation go buy like a welding helmet one of the cheap ones because the welding helmet will scream you from the light and you can watch the whole thing just put it on and you know especially if you have little kids or something to keep them from looking at the light but anyway, so they had said some kind of cosmic event. So Jesus has been involved in that. Um, moving forward into some floods, remember, um, you know, we had the flood and we had all this water. Well, there's something that kind of has to go with that, and it's, it's kind of interesting in that uh, Hebrews 11, he was saying that it never rained prior to the flood because the quote is, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir to the righteousness that comes by faith. Rain could be the correct understanding of things not seen, or it could be returning to the flood in general. Because in Genesis 2, 6 it says, But streams came up from the ground and watered the whole surface of the ground. Before the flood, the earth was possibly surrounded by a firmament or canopy of water, creating a greenhouse effect on the earth's climate. These would have been the waters that God released causing the flood. It seems that before the flood, the dew and ample water supply were enough to keep creation water, watered, 
the Bible does not specifically tell us whether or not it rain had rained before the flood, but Noah seemed to understand what rain was when God mentioned it to him in Genesis 7, 4, 5. In Genesis 2, 4 through 6, so mentions that God did not send rain on the earth until after he created Adam and Eve. We can speculate that it had rained before the flood, but then again, the Bible does not specifically say. But I do want you to remember they noticed this greenhouse, this canopy, this firmament, because we're going to get back to that. Um, just talking about just kind of weather in general, though, Jeremiah has a pretty good statement uh, uh, that kind of kind of puts some of this together about God's creation. Jeremiah 10:12 through 13. It is He who made the earth by His power, who established the world by His wisdom, and by His understanding stretched out the heavens. When He utters His voice, there's a tumult of waters in the heavens, and He makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from the storehouses. Um, and I think it's, you know, they talk about the lightning. That's the, the, you know, the cool thing about lightning that it does for us. I mean, I guess it does some things that we wouldn't like, but at the same time, in the scheme of things, um, it does provide uh, a source of fire. And you're saying, well, we don't really want things to burn. That's, that's a problem for us. But at the same time... Um, when I was 16 or so, we were in Yellowstone, and they had a lightning strike that started a forest fire, and basically the Park Service had determined by then that they needed fire to have certain trees be able to, for their seed pods to open, for more trees to, to occur, more life. And so they actually let that one go uh, because they knew it was a natural start, not from a cigarette or something, dragging chains, they talk on the radio or whatever. Um, and so they, they let that one go. I will tell you, it was pretty incredible to see. Uh, we didn't actually see any actual fire, but the sky turned brown. Um, it, it, you know, you, you kind of got an, a measure of how impressive the fire really was just by color of the, the sky. You look up and it was just brown. You couldn't see the sun through it. It was incredible. Um, and they let it burn. But anyway, the thing that I wanted to also talk about with this is, you know, we talked about that that the Romans had maybe a different view of God. So was he saying that Jesus was God or was he saying that he was a God? You know, that's up for debate. I'll, I'll give you that. But when Jeremiah, his, his, he's talking in, in stark contrast to the pagan peoples around the young nation of Israel. You know, we see mentions of Baal and Asherah and there are multiple others and the people, the pagan peoples of that area um, they had fertility um, deals, and kind of one of the theories was that if you wanted the quote-unquote gods to produce things for the earth as far as farming and fertility and you know offspring of animals and everything, they would uh, uh, have sex so that basically the gods could see this whole thing. And so they, that was one of the things that you would go in and pay your money and have sex with a temple prostitute. And it would be open so that that way the gods could see it to try to, you know, bless or whatever. But the other thing that they had, in addition to, we've got to remember, is that they also had child sacrifice. And so we don't talk about some of that, but that's in there. But it all is, it has to do with them trying to get a way to control the weather or try to encourage the weather to um, produce more crops, more offspring, that sort of stuff. But only God controls the weather. Exodus 14, 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the water, the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So Moses didn't part the Red Sea. God did. But it was, it was in response to trying to protect God's people that this happened. And so it's something that if you were an Egyptian, you couldn't, couldn't help but say, hey, something miraculous happened here. But then again, those Egyptians couldn't tell the story because they went out on what they thought was dry land and God stopped the wind and they drowned. And we actually have archaeological evidence of said pieces of war that are found in, in, in some of these places. So anyway, Proverbs 127. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. 1 Kings 8, 35. When heaven is shut up and there's no rain because they have sinned against you, if you pray towards this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them. 
So God, th these are all statements about God is certainly in charge of, of the weather. Deuteronomy eleven seventeen. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord has given you. And remember in Jonah, you know, we had Jonah disobeying God and in, in Jonah 1, 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. And then in James 5, 17 through 18, you know, like I said, God's still in charge of the weather. His, his people can pray for things to change, but God is ultimately in charge. It said, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the, above, and the earth bore its fruit. One of the interesting things in my life has been just living in different areas. I grew up in a desert, didn't really know it was a desert, but they get like 17 rain, inches of rainfall a year. Central Texas, we get about double that, about 34 inches, something like that. Houston gets more than that. I don't know what it is, but maybe they're probably pushing closer to 45, 50, I don't know, something like that. They get a lot more rain. It's a lot more humid in Houston for anybody who's lived there. Um, and so they definitely have more water. But growing up in the desert, it was not uncommon for there to be a prayer about rain every Sunday. It is either thanking God for the rain that had just occurred or praying that we could get some more. And it was an ongoing deal. And so one of the things that I think that was interesting for me when I was in med school in Houston is that, you know, I had to spend a lot of time studying. But God provided for that because it would rain. And for me, still at my core, I don't like getting wet. Uh, wet socks... I don't like at all. You know, it's kind of weird, and I know that. And I'm like, well, they're just wet feet. They're, and I know that, yeah, if you do it long enough, they can bad, be bad for your feet. But short term, I shouldn't worry about this. I even get just sweaty and want to change shirts because I'm wet, you know, because I grew up in a, in a desert where that I dry off pretty fast. You know, if I had a wet shirt, I could stand out there for a few minutes and my shirt's dry. So in Houston, that didn't happen. But I will tell you that the difference was for me that when it was raining on a weekend and I had to study anyway, I was happy. And my classmates were all, you know, it's raining. I can't go out and do this, and I can't go do this, and I can't go play basketball. I can't do, you know, I can't do this because it was raining. But I had a different approach to rain. Rain made me happy, made me feel good because the people that I grew up around responded that way when we had rain. You know, I remember Abby as a little girl going out one time. We had a good rainstorm, and she had started trying to collect the rain. And so you look in the backyard, and she had all these cups and buckets and just all these things to collect the rain. I don't know. She probably got maybe 40, 50 gallons in just little cups. You know, of course, we didn't do anything with it, but she collected it. She had a great time doing it. So um, I'm just saying that it's interesting that, um, you know, that, that Elijah can stop the rain. But for me, the rain is a good, not a bad. And we'll get to that in a little bit because there are some biblical meanings for the weather and for rain as well. Um, moving into the wind, though, in Hosea 8, 7, it makes the enigmatic statement, for they sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. This proverb is known in modern times for its use in military speeches and as a title for a science fiction novel. Model, novel sorry. But what did Hosea mean? The proverb uses an illustration gleaned from the agricultural process of sowing and reaping. A farmer would sow seeds, and if you don't have equipment to do this, I mean, now farmers have equipment that can precisely put a certain number of seeds per row every certain distance. You know, it's measured by the wheels turning, all this stuff. But back then, they'd have like a sack of seed. You know, you like to see these sacks that people have babies in. They'd be, have a sack of seed, and they would go around, and they would scatter it. And so they're hoping that they can kind of keep it sort of controlled, you know, let's say, you know, you, you might want to sow more on a, uh, on a less windy day than a non, -win you know, very windy day, and, and I'm not even getting the passage where they talk about the wheat and the tares and where the seed went and all that sort of stuff, but he'd sow seed. Of course, the type of seed he planted determined the type of plant that would grow and be harvested. This is the principle of duplication. In Hosea 8, 7, God says that Israel had planted wind and would harvest a whirlwind, taking the wind to mean something worthless and foolish. And Job 7, 7, Proverbs 11, 29, Ecclesiastes 1, 14, 17, kind of talk about this. Can, we can surmise that Israel's foolishness in the past would result in a ver veritable storm of consequence. 
Indeed, in the previous verses, Hosea decries Israel's idolatry. Their foolish pursuit of false gods would reap a severe judgment from the Lord. It, people like to use it as now as a threat to like, you're going to do this and you're going to reap this, when we should be saying, no, it's, it's actually not, a, not a, a judgment. It is a judgment on Israel and everything, but it should be a, an internal judgment when we use this statement because it's saying what we reap, we will sow. And what we do, we will sow. And if we are not following God, that's an idolatry. And so, you know, that, that, is, that is where the focus should be. It's not a focus on using it, I'm going to use it against you. But I am I'm sinful and I need to repent. And, and what I'm sowing is what I'm going to be reaping. And I'm throwing out nothing because my hands are empty because I have nothing to give you, God. And so, therefore, you're giving me nothing back. Maybe that's the way I'd like to say that. Also at, the, at work in this proverb is the multi principle of multiplication. A farmer may plant one kernel of corn, but he will reach much more than that, a whole ear of corn. In the same way, Israel's sin of idolatry would bring forth an amplified consequence that would sweep them all away. The rest of verse 7 notes the results of this whirlwind of judgment. The standing grain has no heads. It shall yield no flour. If it were to yield, strangers would devour it. So the crop would yield nothing. When I, I read that one, I, I kind of get tickled. Last year, I decided I was going to try to plant some uh, tomato plants, and they were doing pretty good. They were maybe a couple of weeks away from tomatoes. And I don't know if it was my goats, my sheep, or the deer that live out there, but something ate my tomato plants down to the nub. Done. One day, gone. So strangers ate my stuff. So the crop would yield nothing. A poor or stolen crop would be devastating. Here God is warning his people that their idolatry would lead to ruin. In addition to following idols, Israel was seeking help in other equally sinful ways. For they had gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Israel had made ill-advised treaties with Assyria for protection from their enemies. Instead of trusting God, they relied on their wealth and the help of pagan nations. The whirlwind that they're talking about came upon Israel, and I'm not saying it's the only whirlwind. There could be another one. We'll get to that. The whirlwind came upon Israel in 722 B.C. when Assyria invaded Israel, destroyed the capital city of Samaria, and deported the Israelites. Yet Hosea 14.4 promised future grace. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. A whirlwind does not last forever, and God's judgments would not be unending. God would later renew the relationship between him and his people. Today we can see the truth of Hosea's Proverbs in many ways. Those who live in unrepentant sin can expect to suffer the consequences of the sin, consequences that both fit the crime and exhibit a stunning intensity. Also, this statement by Hosea is a clarion call to avoid idolatry. Anything that steals our trust in the Lord, lessens our devotion to him, or controls us can be considered an idol and should be abolished from our lives. Now, the wind, though, I'm, you know, he talks about the whirlwind and everything else. I have seen different phenomena with the wind in my 60 years. Uh, I've seen what we call dust devils out west, and a dust devil looks like a little miniature tornado. And if it's big enough, it picks stuff up. Like I've seen a pa piece of paper big pick picked up and go hundreds of feet in the air. And then it just kind of comes back down when the whirlwind stops. But the wind just starts twisting it. Um, I've been inside of little ones. You know, you could actually step into one. And it's, it's just like, you know, there's a lot of sand and dirt and moving and that kind of stuff. It's not, not real pleasant. But I haven't been in I mean, if it was big enough, I'd probably try to avoid it. But that's a little one. That's the way we call those dust devils or whatever. But there also then are tornadoes. And, you know, Central Texas had, had some impressive tornadoes. We've had the one in Gerald that took a, a, about a football field wide swath and it just took everything out. And it looked like literally like a football field for hundreds or for, for at least over a mile out there. You can, st it's where, in, in Gerald right now, it's where they started building all those convenience stores and everything, because it was all plowed, it was clear, there were no trees, done. You know, if you still want to see the results of the last one, you go down, what is it, 2483, heading the, um, one of the back roads towards Florence back there, and they've had some huge devastation. There was a tree, and I'm not joking, this tree's, tree's trunk was as big around as all four of these chairs. This tree had been turned over, and boulders the size of my body were underneath this thing that were in the roots. So it had good roots, and it had good base that was weight, but it still knocked it down. 
it, it, it had taken, somebody had a, a, one of those little flatbed trailers. It was bent up like some kid took a, took a plastic toy and just torqued it. Um, the, the results of that, it was just, getting to see some of that devastation was just amazing. Human beings, um, I know this for a fact, Human beings and that kind of stuff, even blades of grass can be flying so hard that they can stick and puncture you and kill you. So it's, it's incredible. Okay, Jesus using the weather, though. Jesus does tease the people around him with the weather. How many of you have heard, and if you don't know this, you're going to learn it today, and it is very useful. How many of you have heard this phrase, red sky at night, Sailor delight, red sky in morning, sailor take warning. I know Abby has because her dad taught her, but you never heard that. Today, learn it because it's a way of telling what the weather is going to be like the next day, and it is based somehow on how much, how much precipitation is in the air. And so sailors, because they're very dependent on what they can see out there to, to figure it out, red sky at night, sailor delight, red sky at warning, morning, sailor take warning. They know that. Okay, so let's go back 2,000 years. It's not, it's not said that same way by Jesus. We have it as a poem. But Matthew 16, 2 through 3, it said Jesus. He answered them, When is evening, you say, It will be fair, fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. What he's basically telling those people is you spend all this time watching this stuff and he's not saying they're wrong. I mean, I think he's affirming that it's right. You know, God's telling us how to interpret the weather for the next day. If, if you know, sometimes you can't tell, but if you see red sky at night, sailor delight, red sky at morning, you know. Well, the thing that is going with this, though, too, though, is he's telling them, you spend all your time doing this. You got my word. You got my disciples. You got my people. You got prophets for hundreds of years and you don't know who I am you can read all that stuff but you're ignoring the fact that I have come and meet, meeting all the criteria that you've ever set for who your Messiah should be and you don't see it so he's teasing them with the weather but he's using something they can relate to they know it and now you know it and you know I'm not saying it's perfect but I think it's probably pretty good I know that I know a lot of sailors that I know that's who taught me the first one Richard Okay, rain is a blessing, and if it withheld, can be a curse. So I can talk about growing up, and getting rain was a, was a blessing because things turned green and because you had water that things could drink, and, you know, we need water. Which I think one of the reasons that got me going on this sermon anyway is last week I pulled up to, to Burger King, and the girl apologized for the rain because, you know, you're going to get wet trying to get your burger and, you know, pay your money and order and, and I said, you oh, know, no, man, you don't, need to, you don't need to apologize. God's providing this, and I'm delighted, and it should rain a long time. I'd love it. The lakes are empty, you know. We need the water. The water table has dropped. We need the water. And so here she's apologizing, and I felt like all, so I got there, and I said, and you can't control the rain as far as I know, can you? <laughs> but she's going to apologize it because we live in a world of customer service. you got to, you know, got to. Sorry about things I can't control. Joel 2.23, be, be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. And for rain, it's, farmers will tell you it's not just about getting it, but getting it the right time. For example, if you get a good rain when you plant, then you're, you're let's just use corn, corn gets to start. But if you get no more rain, then that corn will eventually wither and die. Or if you get ready to harvest and then it rains a whole lot, that's bad because you can't get your equipment in to harvest your crop. So either way, you can lose if the rain is really off on time. Job 5.10, he gives rain on the earth and sends water on the fields. Leviticus 26.4, then I will give you your rains in their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Amos 4.7, I also withheld the rain from you when there was yet three months to the harvest. I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain, and the field in which it did not rain would wither. Now, I've actually had another fun, really, really cool experience before with rain because I've been out in an open space, you know, nobody else around me, 
And it started raining. And literally, it would be like there's a line of rain here. I'm standing here, and I'm dry. And I can see the water hitting here, just like somebody had a garden hose or something else. And I'm like, God, that's pretty cool. And, and, and guess what he does? It moved over on me. But he let me see that he had control even to a line, you know, water there. I mean, I literally could have done this, but I'm still so struck by it. I thought I'm dry and that's pretty dang cool. And then it moved. But for a moment there, if, I would, if it ever happens again, I'm going to step into it. But, you know, you're going to get wet. So Samuel called, 1 Samuel 12, 18. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Um, and back to the lightning, you know, the lightning produces ozone. It kind of clears the air. It smells better. It really does some really cool stuff. Haggai 1, 11. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Haggai is mean to them. He's saying, you're in trouble. Second Chronicles 7.13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence upon my people. If you think back to the Moses, I know this is in Chronicles, but you think back to Moses, he's reflecting on what Moses did to get the people free from Pharaoh, and a lot of it had to do with what they could control with the weather or the quitters or whatever. Zechariah 14:17. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. That's a threat. You better come worship or you're not going to get any. Zechariah 10, 1. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain for the Lord who makes the storm clouds and he will give them showers of rain to everyone, the vegetation, the field. Psalm 135, 7. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind for his storehouses. Hailstones, moving on to other types of rain and weather. Joshua 10, 11. And as they fled before Israel while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran, the Lord threw down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekiah, and they died. They were no more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. In other words, what they're saying is Israel was fighting, but God wiped out just as many with hailstones as they did with, you know, so you're walking around, hey, this one's got a hole, somebody, somebody stuck him. Oh, this one's just dead. This one's just dead. This one's, and so they're counting and saying, look, God did half the battle, you know, just with the hailstones alone. Ezekiel 13, 13. Therefore, so says the Lord God, I will make a stormy wind break out in my wrath, and there shall be a deluge of rain in my anger and great hailstones in wrath to make a full end. And if you really want to get into... Um, the future and I've the biggest hailstone that I've actually personally held was about the size of my palm from the one that we had this past year but put this image in your head and great hailstones about 100 pounds each fell from heaven on people and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe Revelation 16 21 it's coming and we know how, I mean, hailstones form because they're kind of cool because you got cold air up high and it has to create a circular motion. So a raindrop and it, then it gets circled around and gets a little more, more coating and it keeps coating and coating and coating and coating until it gets heavier enough that it drops. But the wind up there is good enough to create kind of like this, you know, clothes dryer effect and the water keeps getting iced and, you know, chilling and, you know, collects a little water and then gets, becomes ice, a little water ice and then drops. 100 pounds is a pretty good cycle. Psalm 78, 47. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamores with frost. And that's the biggest problem with hail is, yeah, we think about more about our roofs and stuff like that and denting our cars. But if you have a crop, you know, hail can just totally destroy that crop. Ezekiel 38, 22, he's talking about futuristic stuff. And he says, with pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples who are with him, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. So Ezekiel kind of gives you a pretty bleak, you, you watch out. Okay, Jesus, remember, is in the boat. But before we get to Jesus in the boat in the storm, I'm going to tell you about that. I've got to take you to Psalm 107:29. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. That was 
many, many years before Jesus. But Psalms talks about that, that one sentence. So we'll get to that. So in Luke 8, 23 to 25, and there's multiple versions of the different Gospels. But it says, as they sailed, he fell asleep, meaning Jesus. And a windstorm came down the lake, and they were filled with water and were in danger. Now, remember, we talked about that when I've done this, just this passage before as a, as a sermon, that not all sailors can swim. There are people that are sailors in the United States Navy today that can't swim. Yeah, it sounds crazy. Now, you don't have to be a sailor to be in a boat, right? So there are sailors who can't swim. And I don't think it's that odd because there are pilots who can't fly. I mean, they can fly in a plane, but they can't fly. <laughs> I'm being funny. I'm being funny. But... You get what I'm saying is that there, but there, we know that there are sailors that have already, they've been in their boat. I've been fishing with guys like this, and I'm like, you can't swim, but you love to fish, and you love to get in a boat, and you're in a lot of water, and you can't swim. It, it happens. So we don't know if the disciples could swim, but they're with Jesus, okay? And they, they, they were fishermen. So they were used to being in the boat, and you fall out of the boat, you get a hold of the boat, and get back in the boat. You don't, you don't, you know, you, otherwise you drown. But they, they, you know, they didn't. May not know how to swim. And, he, and it said that, and as they, they sailed, they fell asleep. Master, master, we are perishing. And he revoked, he rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying one to another, who is this then that he, he commands even winds and water? And they obeyed him. The disciples, Mark's version says, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. We like that verse. Um, actually, what's funny is it, it probably really came across more as something like hush. Because why would he have to make this proclamation? You know, if Jesus is going to, it's just like we go, let there be light for God in the New in King James Version. God, when God's creating light, as he, if, he doesn't even have to say it. He can just think it and there'll be light. But as he says it, he's probably going to just say one word and it's going to happen. I think the same thing for Jesus. He probably just, he, he woke up. He saw what they were doing, and he looked at the, the storm and just said, hush. Like you'd tell a baby, hush, and it happened. And so what I think is funny, but, you know, see, he made the, this, back to Psalms, he made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Just like you'd tell a baby, hush. And, you know, why, why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? You know, who is the wind that obey him? You know, then he wrote Rebose and you know, whatever. Okay, moving forward into Luke 12, 54. And he also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, A shower is coming. And so it happens. Well, it doesn't always happen. You know that. Matthew 8, 26 through 27. And he said to them, Why are you afraid a little of faith? And then he rose and rebuked the winds of the sea, and this is a great calm. And men marveled at him, What sort of man is this, you know? Um, whether as statements of faith and reality. John 3, 8. This is one that I, I carry this one with me a lot. It's about weather, but it has some deep implications for us as human beings, as Christians, etc. So I want you to kind of think about this one. John 3, 8. The bl wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So you don't know who's really saved or not, and it's not for us to judge, but it's for us to let them all know and let them make their own choices. And then the next one I like is Matthew 5:45, which also I walk with as a daily has a daily application, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so. You know, when we see a calamity in our world, that somebody got hit by a tornado, they got flooding or whatever, sometimes we want to say, well, that's God's judgment on them. I think, I think in Matthew what he's really saying is uh, these things happen, but it doesn't mean it's judgment because I know that there are good people who are in that community that it flooded. And I know that there are good people who's had their houses destroyed by a tornado. I know that there are good people. So I think that's a warning to us to not make assumption, even though these, these verses about rain and hail and whatever, don't make an assumption that because this weather event happened to them that God is doing it to them. Does that make a good, kind of make sense? Weather and predictions of things to come. Nahum 1.4. 
The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Going into the future, Psalm 148.8, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Isaiah 29.6, you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and flame of a devouring fire. Luke 21.11, there will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. We're looking forward to that. Maybe we're not, but it's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, Matthew 24, 7. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And with that one, I've got one more verse, I think, at the end. But I want to kind of talk a little bit about something that I've been watching. And, you know, basically, for me, I think we are people of simple minds. I know that my intellect compares nothing with Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of hosts. I know that I'm... My brain is not there, trust me. And I'm certainly not a weatherman, meteorologist, geologist, paleontologist, whatever. But we get, today, we get caught up making all sorts of crazy thoughts about the levels of CO2 and how we're all going to die. If they really believe that, some of these people, they build their houses on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island. They live in coastal areas, Maryland, Delaware, Washington, D.C., all that East Coast, you know, these politicians. And you're like, if you really believe that, then why would you, you know, if you really believe that, why would you fly in your jets? Um, or maybe they're just more important than people they're supposed to represent. You notice I didn't say leaders, I said representatives. They're supposed to be representatives. What is fascinating, if you look at our world, water is more important than CO2. Because where is the biggest heat sink for water that we have in our world? What is our world, 80% ocean, something like that? I don't remember the number, but it's a math person, you know? 70-something 70, 70 maybe, whatever. Water is our heat sink. Water makes up a whole lot more of our atmosphere in the air than carbon dioxide does today. So what, when I remember I said that greenhouse thing from Genesis, the greenhouse, it probably was like living in a nice Houston. It was probably like going in a greenhouse that's cool. And if you've ever been in a greenhouse that they actually have it cool, but it's kind of nice to be able to breathe in cool, moist air. Not nice to have sweaty and, you know, but I think that the greenhouse that Adam and Eve lived in was nice, but there was moisture in the air, you know, and it, but it was cool. It wasn't hot. And so the water is probably a bigger factor in our world for what is going on with our climate than CO2. And let me get into some other little weird points. Plants need carbon dioxide. If there's too little, they must stay open longer in order, and otherwise they'll dehydrate. If, there, if there's plenty of carbon dioxide, they can take that and convert it through food, through photosynthesis, and create nutrients and stuff, okay? Of our atmosphere, not this part, but even this is not, it's kind of part of it. But when you really get into the atmosphere of our Earth, it's 0.04% is CO2. We are at 400 parts per million of CO2 now. According to some people who are, uh, you know, still in the paleontology, geologists, whatever, they can take core samples and they can open up rocks and see what the CO2 levels were in the past. And it has been much higher, much higher. In fact, they're saying that some of the stuff that we have now, we're actually kind of at a low. And that they've noticed some of these lows precede ice ages because we've had several different ice ages. So, you know, I'm not saying I know what the answer is, but we seem to be so focused on CO2 as being that this is what we've got to defeat. We've got to fix this. We've got to worry about it. I'm saying I don't know that. But my concern is in many ways we are worshiping Mother Earth, not God. We're making our decisions based on what we think is going to happen instead of putting our faith in what is going to happen. And I tell you, Revelation's got a lot to tell us of what's going to happen. Global warming, climate change, we can't even stick with the same words. Do we think that we can control this? Do we think that we really, you know, we, we, get, all, you know, we get all caught up in stuff that I say, but we are not in charge. Our world is small. 
A monkey wear, can wear a cute hat in Sri Lanka and the world can see it instantly all over the world on TikTok, right? You know, some cu something cute happens. As, Where's this from? I don't know. Yeah, Chris, of all people, can tell us about the stuff that he knows, that, that, you know, on his phone that, you know. And so that's our world. It can happen somewhere else. And you're like, well, where was that? Is it in Philadelphia? Is that in Dallas? Is Oh, no, that's what? And you look at the time, say, 15 minutes ago. That's our world. It doesn't even take reporters to tell us the news now. We can have people on their phones, and we got the news. Our world is small, like I said. But when I talk about that, in, in many ways, what's really weird is we are very short-sighted on our observations. You know, we haven't had satellites all of, have we had satellites all of my life? No. All of my life? No. All of your life? Maybe. But satellites are what we're using to record things now, what's green, what's not, how much water, where's the, you know. We, but we don't have data to go back far enough to really know short of what I'm telling you about some of these geologists who can dig samples out and look at numbers. And they're not saying that the numbers are that dramatic right now, but we're freaking out about it. But the, when I talk about the world being small, how many hurricanes do we have? Everybody acts like, this is the worst storm ever. This is a horrible hurricane. This is, you know, this hurricane season is going to have more than ever. This is a record breaking. We're talking record breakings from maybe the 50s and all of that, but we're now looking at not just hurricanes that occur that hit land, which is what they recorded in the older days because they didn't have the satellites to see the ones that fizzed out and didn't hit an island that was any importance or did whatever it's going to do, kind of went to the coast and created some storm. But it, it never, they never saw it as a hurricane. And yet we now have, because we can measure the turn of that thing and say, now it's a class one, now it's a class two, whatever. And so our world is different in what we're reporting on events like hurricanes. You know, we give them names now. Back then they didn't. <laughs> you know, big wind. Next. And so I think that we are making observations in a very short period of time, and we're trying to extrapolate that, and it's probably not that great of a deal. But what I, what you know, how many hurricanes do we have versus ones that actually make landfall and do damage? That's what we really need to be looking at, the ones that do damage, and we try to say it's record numbers. I got a friend who was from Houston, and Alicia, I believe, he told me about in med school, he said that he got to go downtown after Hurricane Alicia, and he said downtown during that hurricane would have been a nightmare if you were down there because he said the windows, we're talking about windows earlier, the window glass in those big tall buildings, many of it came out and they said that sheets would come down of that glass and he said it went through car roofs and car hoods and he said it would still be intact but the glass had pierced through the, the roof of that thing. He said, can you imagine being on the ground and having that coming down on you? Weather, wind. But I guess my, 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 my take home on this is we have people to actually feed, but yet we wage war over abundant resources. We're cutting how much our farmers have for fertilizer because it might produce CO2, whatever. We, you know, we worry about things that might actually not destroy our planet. We might do better with more CO2 and not less, but we don't really know that, so we're going to go after CO2 when the reality is the plants might do better. They've had times they've had more. And low numbers are not good because low numbers of CO2 means that the plants don't have as much and we go towards an ice age. So, you know, we don't have efficient batteries. That's one of our biggest problems. You can, you know, if, it would be great if we had a battery that we can charge and say, okay, I'm putting 100% of this energy, let's say a, a unit of one energy, but I'm going to get back a half of that energy back. So I've wasted half the energy just to charge it and it's going to be heat and all these other things, but I don't get it back. So our batteries are inefficient. Even our best batteries are inefficient. Um, our windmills that we have, the tur wind turbines, and trust me, they're, they're polluting all over West Texas, I joke. Uh, there's a lot of them. And, and actually, I've seen them grow in my lifetime because cool, interesting, whatever thing about the windmills out there at night is that when you have a tower like for radio, it blinks. And, it, and if you have two of them, it'll blink, but they blink at different rates. If you have those windmills, they're all on a circuit, and so that circuit goes off, so you have light, and, it, and the red goes this way. 
red, it goes, you know, whatever direction. So the current travels, you get far enough away, you can say, those are windmills, those are windmills, those are towers. So you can tell the difference. But windmills, though, appar I, apparently we can't recycle them. The blades and all that, that fiberglass technology that make them what they are, at some point they, they get going in a landfill because we can't chew them up and figure out something to do with them. That's one. It's, you know, and it's too cost prohibitive even if you could try to do it. We put up solar panels, but solar panels aren't perfect. We've had a, this, a case this year that a solar panel burned a house because it got o overheated, and so the roof caught fire. Uh, solar panels have a lifetime. You have all these materials that are in it. They're certainly not biodegradable. They're certainly not something that's going to go back into the earth, you know. And so we've got glass and all the chemicals and everything else. So we're, we're chasing all of this. Like in, in a way, I'm kind of like saying it's like chasing false gods when we maybe ought to focus on what we need to do with the people we got now and the world we have now. And back to like my, my earlier quote from, you know, that got, we started on this. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. You know, we've got this horrible war in Ukraine that, that you know, you, you get to see on the, in the news the people that are suffering are, are, are children and women and elderly, and, you know, we got this going. So why do we do this? But anyway, so here's your helpful closing deal. Genesis 8, 22. So I'm taking you back to the beginning to tell you about the end. Kind of fun. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. While the earth remains, you're going to have seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, night, not going to cease. Pastor Beamer, would you close us in prayer? I have, haven't done that one, and I haven't studied it, so I'll have to look at that. Peter saw the wind. No, he started walking. Peter walked to Jesus on the water. So for that, my brain says, the only way that I know that that could happen, I guess, is that every time he puts a foot down, that it instantly freezes probably to a certain depth, like being on an iceberg. And every time he steps, it, and it's got to be really cool. It's, it's a song that, you know, that I've, I've had a chorus for. I haven't finished it all yet, yet, but walking on the water with Jesus, walking on the water with God. Can you imagine, though, that's a huge faith statement for Peter to say, I'm coming to you. Could he swim? We don't know, because he certainly was afraid when he went in. And he said, save me. Whereas most people could swim would say, okay, hi. You know, so maybe Peter couldn't swim. But I, I'll have to look at the seeing the wind. I don't, I don't know. That's something I've missed in that, because I'm in the other parts of the picture. I guess. How are you doing? Thank you, Brian. Where did, where did Dr. Beam go? Get him back in here. Happy birthday to you.
miracles. You've seen some miraculous things with Jesus, you know. In fact, one of the ways they got in trouble by the, the Pharisees and stuff is that they were walking to Jerusalem and they were walking through a field that had wheat in it and they were picking up heads of feet, wheat and kind of mushing it in and just chewing it. They having a little snack, you know, a little granola bar or whatever. You want and they got in trouble because the Pharisees looked at that as harvesting and milling grain. That's how small of details they went after him and his people. But I think you've got to understand that, you know, just being with this guy had to be pretty incredible because you could see how that he could influence the weather, how that he could walk on water, how that he could control storms and do things that we can't. And so, you know, it's kind of funny. We, we kind of take for granted we have food and then we have all this stuff, but they were with, connected with the source of all this, the source of the rain, the source of the, the harvest, the th source of the sunshine. But he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take in remembrance of me. So there's our wheat and our grain. And this is fruit of the vine. You know, they take grapes and they crush them and they make grape juice and you ferment it and you can have wine or you can make, I think you make vinegar out of grapes too if you don't do it right. I don't know. But, you know, this is grape juice, but he said, this is my blood which is shed for you, doing the remembrance of me. Thank you all. Y'all have a